Today, I would like to share with you my top four of the best features of Scala 3 for Scala.js users. Let me start with top-level definitions. And in the context of Scala.js, AdJS native top-level definitions. In Scala.js, when we want to call a JavaScript library, we use facade types. Here is a typical example of a facade for a JavaScript class. We annotate the class state with at JS native to tell the compiler that it is only a facade and that the actual definition is somewhere in a JavaScript library. We also use the at JS global annotation to specify where it is defined, in this case, in the JavaScript global scope. The body of concrete methods is replaced with calls to a fake method, JS native. We can then use date as if it were a regular class, for example, to print a timestamp as a string. There is a straightforward symmetry here between the facade and the native class. We represent the JavaScript top-level class, date, with a Scala top-level class. What if we need to call a JavaScript top-level function, such as fetch? Fetch is a global function in browsers, which performs HTTP requests. It returns a promise of a so-called response. The response's text method, in turn, returns a promise of the body as a string. Of course, that API has many more methods and options, but we are going to focus on that simple use case for now. At the bottom, we use a for comprehension to navigate the promises and to eventually print the body to the console. When declaring the facade for fetch, we have to wrap it in an object. We choose to call it globals in this example, but the name does not matter. That object is artificial. It does not represent anything from the JavaScript API. It exists only because Scala 2 does not allow top-level devs. Moreover, because the declaration is not at the top level, the compiler requires us to explicitly state the JavaScript name of the function as a parameter to the AdJS global annotation. While this works and is widely used in practice, it breaks the symmetry between the JavaScript API and its facade types in Scala.js. In Scala 3, top-level devs are allowed we can move the declaration of fetch to the top level and, as a bonus, remove the string argument of AdJS global. We get rid of the artificial object globals and we restore the symmetry between the JavaScript API and the Scala.js facade. This helps when writing facade as well as using them. While not revolutionary, AdJS native top-level definitions are one way in which Scala 3 will help Scala.js developers. The second feature I want to share with you is anonymous class inference. It is perhaps even less remarkable than top-level definitions, but it will nevertheless bring a nice quality of life improvement to Scala.js users. Let me expand a bit on our fetch example. We can configure many aspects of fetch through a second argument. That argument is typically a literal object with fields for various options, all of them optional. I refer to that pattern as a config object. Here, we use fetch from JavaScript code with an explicit HTTP method. This may be an example that we find in the library documentation and we need to translate it to Scala.js. The way we represent config objects in Scala.js is with a trait that extends JS object. We declare all the optional fields as vars of type js.undefor and we initialize them with js.undefined. 
here, we define only two fields, method, which we are interested in, and credentials to demonstrate one that we do not use. The names method and credentials exist in the JavaScript API and in its documentation. However, the name fetch init is pure fiction. We have to invent it for the purposes of the facade in Scala.js. With the updated facade, we can look at the call site. We typically create a config object as an anonymous class that extends fetch init. This is fairly readable, but if we compare the Scala.js code to the JavaScript reference, we see at once that fetch init is out of place. It is worse when initially writing the code. We cannot use the JavaScript reference only. We also have to look up what name the facade author invented for the config object parameter. When translating code from a reference documentation, this additional lookup can become quite annoying. This is where anonymous class inference helps. In the same situation, Scala3 can automatically infer the required parent trait. We only have to write new and braces. The resulting code has a more dynamic feel. However, of course, everything is still type-checked at compile time. If we misspell method or if we give it a number, the compiler will report an error. More importantly, this means that we can translate the reference JavaScript code to Scala.js without having to consult any additional documentation. This reduces friction when calling JavaScript libraries from Scala.js, improving the, dev the developer experience ever so slightly. I cannot talk about Scala3 and Scala.js without mentioning union types. Union types are everywhere in the JavaScript ecosystem. Let us take another look at our fetch function. Earlier, we declared it with the parameter URL of type string. That was a simplification of reality. Actually, URL can either be a string or an instance of the request class. While overloads can sometimes be enough, the JavaScript API landscape is such that union types quickly become necessary. In fact, in Scala.js, we so desperately needed union types that we invented them in Scala 2. With the appropriate import, we can write string or request as the type of URL. And then we can pass either type of argument at call site without boilerplate. The bar is not a true union type in Scala 2, of course. We call it a pseudo union type. Its implementation consists of an elaborate mix of implicit conversions and type classes, which give the right illusions and the correct semantics. As long as all we need is assigning values of individual types to union types and pass those to JavaScript, it is very good at its job. If we need to manipulate them from Scala.js, for example, as a result type from a JavaScript function, the illusion starts breaking. Here, I use a synthetic example. Suppose that we want to handle the two possible types of values of a union type. The most straightforward way to do so is with a pattern match. While the code seems obvious enough, the Scala2 compiler is not happy. It tells us that an int cannot possibly be a valid int or string, which is quite confusing. In fact, this may be the most common question that I see popping up in the Scala.js Gitter channel. This happens because at the type system level, int or string is a separate trait, and so int is not a subtype of it. The workaround in Scala 2 is to add an ascription to any. It is basically impossible to come up with it unless you already know how to do it. But at least it works. The ascription to any 
also means that exhaustivity checking is lost. If we forget one case, the compiler will not warn us. In Scala 3, we have true native union types. Unsurprisingly, the original pattern match is valid out of the box. Moreover, we keep exhaustivity checking. So if we forget a case, we get a nice warning from the compiler. Scala.js users desperately needed union types, enough that we invented the pseudo union type for Scala 2, which is widely used despite its shortcomings. With Scala 3, they are finally part of the core type system, which means that they are much better integrated with the rest of the language. Finally, perhaps my favorite feature of Scala 3, opaque type aliases. While they are often advertised as a more performant alternative to value classes, they really shine when used for interoperability in Scala.js. In JavaScript, for a long time, all we had were objects and arrays. And as the saying goes, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So many JavaScript libraries represent dictionaries as plain old objects. And since JSON does that, the idiom is far from dead. This JavaScript code snippet creates an empty object and uses it as a dictionary with int values. It also passes it to json.stringify, which serializes it as a string. We can translate that verbatim to Scala.js using js.dynamic. However, it is both inconvenient and unsafe. When the key is not statically known, we have to explicitly use the verbose methods select dynamic and update dynamic. In addition, nothing prevents the developer from inserting values of the wrong type in the dictionary. We would like to build some sort of abstraction over JS.dynamic with a safe and map-like API. In addition, we want that abstraction to allow interoperability we want to be able to pass a dictionary to json.stringify in a meaningful way. The first thing that comes to mind is to use a value class. We define a class dictionaryAnyval, which extends Anyval and encapsulates a JS dynamic. The methods apply and update will provide the map-like API. While they contain casts, those are necessary, essential ones they provide the type safety on top of the unsafe JS dynamic. Overall, this is a pretty standard class. Let us see how we use it. As far as the MapLipe API goes, dictionary AnyVal is very nice. We can add key value pairs and look up keys in a safe and convenient way. When it comes to calling json.stringify, however, we have a problem. Dictionary AnyVal is not a subtype of JS Any, which Stringify requires. We may have heard that it is always safe to cast to JS Any, so we try that. Unfortunately, things don't go according to plan at runtime. Stringify produces garbage. Dictionary AnyVal is not fit for an interoperability scenario. The JavaScript code sees an instance of Dictionary AnyVal with its Scala.js internals instead of the underlying js.dynamic. Value classes therefore don't help. Back to the drawing board. The solution that we found in Scala 2 uses a sealed trait pattern. We declare a sealed trait dictionary that extends js.any and that has no concrete subclass. How do we create values of that trait then? Well, we create JS the dynamic values and we then cast our way into a dictionary. This is valid because dictionary is a JavaScript type and cast to JS types are always valid. Publicly, dictionary has no API. We add the API as extension methods with an implicit class. In the implementation, we have to cast back and forth between JS dynamic and dictionary. 
the highlighted as instance of show those undesirable casts. Overall, this pattern is pretty confusing. Unless you are very familiar with the semantics of Scala.js, it is difficult to understand. Nevertheless, at least it provides a very nice and correct API at use site. Like the value class approach, we get the MapLife API through the implicit extensions. And like JS Dynamic, we can pass it to json.stringify without cast, and it returns the expected result. The seal trait pattern is convenient and correct at use site. However, its definition, and hence its documentation, is confusing. It is now time to see what Scala 3 has to offer. We now define dictionary as an opaque type alias. It is privately known to be an alias of JS Dynamic, but that knowledge is hidden from users. In addition, we publicly advertise that it is a subtype of JS Any with the less than column syntax. Because of the private knowledge, we can implement empty without cast. In its companion object, the compiler knows that dictionary is an alias of JS Dynamic. For the instance methods, we use Scala3 extension methods. Although an implicit class would have worked as well. Bonus Scala3 feature. Unlike the seal trade pattern, no unexpected cast is necessary. We still have the two essential casts, of course. This definition using an opaque type alias is much more straightforward than the seal trade pattern. Although, in fact, it is completely equivalent. Indeed, at call site, nothing has changed. The code is exactly the same as with the seal trait. The opaque type alias brings a very nice way to define dictionary, while retaining all the convenience and safety of the seal trait at use site. You would think opaque type alias were invented on purpose to replace the confusing Scala.js pattern. We come back one final time to our familiar fetch function. We slightly improve the safety of the API with another opaque type alias. This time, we use it for the values of the method option. We previously defined it as a string, but it can only take specific values. It is a typical example of an enum a la JavaScript. We can define a method type as an opaque type alias over a string. In its companion object, we define constants for the valid values. And at call site, we now have to use those constants, which is safer. That concludes this video on my favorite Scala3 features for Scala.js. As a recap, at JS native top level definitions allow our facade to directly mirror the JavaScript APIs. With anonymous class inference, we avoid Scala.js specific invented names for config objects. The native union types advantageously replace the Scala.js pseudo union type with a better integration into the type system. And finally, opaque type aliases provide straightforward abstractions over JavaScript data types. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video and more importantly, that you will enjoy Scala.js with Scala3. If you have questions, or if you want to share your favorite Scala3 features for Scala.js, let us know in the comments below. See you next time.